Welcome back. You're listening to the discussion Innovation in Government, sponsored by Kerasoft on Federal News Network. I'm your host, Jason Miller. My guest today is Jason Schick, the General Manager for U.S. Public Sector at Confluent. Now, Jason, before break, we were talking about this idea of sharing services, if you will, sharing data, the interagency connection. And it, I guess, occurs to me as we're having this conversation is, why not just create a big data lake? We hear that all the time, or, or a data ocean, or, or whatever we're calling it mm -hmm. these days, and people can just kind of tap in, tap out as they need it. Why is that not necessarily the, the best approach? Yeah, so it's really not an either or kind of approach that makes sense when, when you look at the whole of government. It, it's both. And so if you look at apps, systems that are designed for the people that take action, um, they run on data. And so, <clears throat> Um, they might query the data that's in those data lakes. And in those data lakes, they're, they're important systems for analytics purposes um, or data refineries. But because the apps run on data, it means you need a way to get the data to flow to those apps. Um, back to what I was saying before about data in motion. As something happens in the real world that the person on the front line needs to know about, you want, that, you want the best data to show up in their hands so they can do something. And so you need a way to move data from the data lake or from wherever it's generated and perhaps even combine stuff that's in the data lake with other sensor generated data and bring it to the people that are on the front lines. So it's, you know, data lakes are good, they're important, but you need that connective tissue to, to move the data to the place where it has the greatest impact. And the point being here, uh, just to maybe put a finer discussion on it is, if it's in the lake, it's probably older data, and maybe old is not the best word, but it's, it's more historical. And because the way data changes and moves, and those sensors are drawing data every day. If you think about NOAA and National Weather Service, they have a buoy in the ocean that's telling you the temperature, and it's, you know, today it's 52 degrees, and an hour later it's 53 degrees. That's that change, while well, you may have the historical data that tells you, oh, last year the temperature's been this. That's a great example. That's absolutely right. It's, it's a good expl explanation of why you need not either or, but data lakes and this platform of motion. So let's maybe talk a little bit about that platform of motion. As agencies are considering it, why they're considering it, what, what are some of those things that they should keep in mind? What are some of those benefits? <clears throat> sure, yeah, so it, it probably makes sense to, to look at some of the, um, the objectives that are laid out in the federal data strategy um, you know, under the conscious design principles. So <clears throat> there are things that, that they call out explicitly, collection, dissemination. Um, data needs to be appropriate, accurate, objective, accessible, useful, understandable, timely. Um, the, the objective here is for the reuse of data and the ability to acquire additional data. Um, and the, the data strategy calls for a plan for reuse and to build in interoperability from the start. So those are all, I'm just pulling those directly from the federal data strategy. I think a lot of these are, are self-reinforcing, and there are a couple core themes that I think are important to, to understand as we talk about a platform. Um, so uh, core to data is trust, right? If, if I'm using data, especially from an external organization where I don't know the people, I don't know the history around the data, then how do I know it hasn't been tampered with? How do I know what it really means? How do I know when it's up to date? How do I get it from the right source or the best source? Um, Data needs to be discoverable and accessible. So what is out there? How do I know what's out there? Um, how can I get to it without burning out my budget? Um, if I'm the owner, how do I share it without burning out my budget <laughs> and overloading my team? Uh, the objective is to have a flexible data framework so we can make it possible to share data within and across organizations with, without locking ourselves into that, that brittle set of interdependencies. Um, so how can we keep innovating without forcing everybody to take that next step together all at once? Um, and then you know, the timeliness of data is, is essential, and, and that's, that's probably the good, the good inflection point in, in this, this talk track. That not every government use case requires data to flow in real time, but I think most people would agree they want the right people notified when something important happens. And so that, that's all what the government is trying to do. So to meet those objectives, you want a data layer that uses a publish and subscribe paradigm so data sources can be discoverable and consumable by any party as long as they're authorized. You want the data to be transmitted on a platform where it can't be tampered with. So 
you know, in the case of Confluent, it's built on top of an immutable commit log. So if the data is in there, you know that it hasn't been monkeyed with. Um, you want the ability to, to synchronize different systems in different data streams so you can combine them in lots of different ways. You know, it's, you want to be able to reuse data and you want to be able to um, build in interoperability from the start. And you need to set yourself up so, so different use cases you haven't thought about yet can be, can be delivered. Um, and so that means you have to have decoupled data producers and consumers. Um, and then it's got to be something that can scale. So it's got to be able to support heavy throughput, low latency, um, as well as you know, scenarios where the data volumes are lower, the, the requirements might um, not require nearly as, as fast a response time, but you want a data platform that can span that entire, that entire range. And if you, if you have that, then that makes it, that, that's a connective layer that allows you to, to incorporate your data lakes, your data catalogs, uh, the data refineries. So if you think about the government as a body, each of these are organs. And you know, you, you got lungs, you got a brain, you got a kidney. They all do different things. They all do different things with data. Um, in this scenario, you need a connective tissue. And at Confluent, we think of ourselves as that central nervous system. I want to go back to something you said just briefly is uh, immutable commit log. And, and I think we know what it means, but let's just put a finer point on it because I think that's the key here. Make sure your data is not monkeyed with or, or messed with. Immutable, you think of, I think of blockchain and how, you know, how, how that works, the distributed ledger approach. Is, mm -hmm. is that basically, I know it's not necessarily using that technology, but, but that's what you're saying here is, is once the data comes in, you know who's changed it, who's read it, who's touched it. You have all those things. Mm -hmm. yeah, Talk that, a little bit through. That's that's that is right, and there are a lot of things that are that are I think similar between that immutable commit log and a blockchain, for example. And it's it's really useful. You you almost said it right there. Is you know, when something happens, and you know either it was really good or really bad, uh, you probably want to go back and see what really happened. And so you want the ability to go replay that data, and maybe in the context of other data feeds. And so by having that immutable commit log, having the ability to persist that data, it allows you to do things like replay an incident. Maybe it's a cyber breach or something like that. You can replay that and, and learn from it, study it, and, and then incorporate that perhaps into AI and ML models that you might be looking to deploy later. You knew where I was going next, because I was going to ask you, because we talked about the volume of data, you have the velocity of data, you have the veracity of data, the, the Vs of data, and, and the only way to deal with all of that data is, is what's coming to be is, is intelligent automation, AI, ML. How, do, how, do, how are you guys looking at those new and, and emerging capabilities to, to help with the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're essential. And you know, the, they've gotten a lot of attention, and I think rightfully so. There are a couple tricks, though, and some, some of the things, if you look at some of the, the more prominent government AI um, initiatives, data acquisition is, is a challenge. And so we've talked about the, the virtues of Confluent before. We do a lot to help make data more accessible. So just as an enabler, that I think we're, we're a really valuable piece of that ecosystem there. But then there's the next piece of talking about AI and ML. Um, when we think about analytics, I think there's a natural tendency to think about uh, interrogating large stores of historical data to build models and train models. And you know, that's, that's important. You, if you don't have enough data to build a model, you don't have, you've just got, <laughs> you've got an opinion. Um, but <clears throat> once you've got those models, then how do, you, how do you operationalize them? How do you inject them into the business or in the mission? Well, you probably, in a number of cases, want to apply those AI and ML models to the data in motion as it's moving from wherever it's captured to the people that are responsible for taking some action. And so the ability to, to inject those AI and ML models into your data streams should be part of what, uh, you know, what data-centric, data-driven government professionals are thinking about. Is that further down the path when you talk about data in motion and really making data accessible and, and, and proactive, or can folks use those 
technologies as AI, ML, whether they're a novice in this kind of world of data in motion or they're you know, in that medium stage, the crawl, walk, run, where does AI and ML kind of fit? Everywhere probably, but. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's happening now, right? So there are, there are a lot of data scientists out there and, and you know, the government's spending a lot of energy on how to grow more. So that's happening sort of in parallel and I think that's it's probably a healthy thing. They're going to learn things about about model development and curation and, and drift and things like that that they can apply as more and more data streams come online. So I, I see them naturally becoming intertwined over time, but they, I don't think it has to be an interdependency up front. There's a lot of gains to be had working both of them independently today, but if we look at where things ultimately are going to go for like best, they will come together. As we talk about data in motion and as agencies and, and other organizations in the private sector as well, I'm sure are making better use, making the data more valuable. Give me an example of maybe where this is actually happening <clears throat> and, and what are some of those approaches private sector, public sector organizations are using? Sure, yeah. So uh, one, one of my favorite use cases right now is uh, a, a civilian agency, which I, I can't really name yet. Um, they were looking to modernize, they were working to modernize uh, their uh, claims processing, so application and claims processing. And that requires a whole lot of steps, um, both internally and um, checking on data from other government agencies to determine eligibility of, of the applicant. And so um, by modernizing and, and sharing that data um, in a, a near real-time way, uh, they're able to offer a, a much better um, experience to the applicant, and they're able to act a lot faster, so when there are fraudulent applications, they can take action. They can identify it and take action a lot faster. Um, and what's really cool about that is that this is a, a pretty straightforward effort on their part that brings together different systems across different agencies. In the commercial space, there are a ton of blue chip customers that are modernizing the way they run their business on top of Confluent. And some of those names are Uber, and Capital One, and Walmart, Humana, Intel Corporation. And you know, the, the scenarios range from um, customer experience applications, uh, modernizing eligibility and claims processing, real-time situational awareness of things that are in both the physical and the cyberspace. So there's a lot out there that we can draw inspiration from, um, and we're starting to do a lot of that in, in the federal space now. Uh, it feels like we're entering something of a golden age for data uh, in the federal space, and it, it's an exciting time to be here. The examples you provided, the, the, the thing to keep in mind here is, it's not so much the data for the data's sake, but it, it's, it's improving a process, improving an outcome. I think that's the key here, is getting Having that uh, data in motion, to use your term, it is th there's an end result that these companies, organizations are looking for. That's exactly right. It, if you bring data to that point of impact, you can have a much more rewarding experience, you can have a much more personalized experience, and, and also a more cost-effective experience. I think that's what you're seeing with your example in the civilian agency as well, that if they're dealing with claims processing, we all know what that's like. It's, all, it's, it's not a pleasant one many times, and, and how many times do I have to fill out my name, or how many times do I have to fill out my address, and if that can be done in, through automation as well, that, that can make life easier because it's pulling data from when, multiple sources. When, when done well, I think it's good for everybody. Uh, Jason, we're just out of time before I let you go. In, in 30 seconds or less, if you can, what's the big takeaway from our conversation? What should agencies keep in mind? Yeah, so start small. And what you get with, with something like a Confluent is you get the ability to try ideas out. You can go download software at no charge. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can learn from on our developer site and in Git repositories. Um, and you can start to try your ideas and, and get people on board with those ideas organizationally. So we encourage that. Um, check us out, confluent.io, government and you're going to start to see some cool things that hopefully get your juices flowing. All right, I'm sure we'll have a link to that too on federalnewsnetwork.com. But unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today, so let me thank my guest. Jason Schick is the General Manager for U.S. Public Sector at Confluent. Jason, thank you so much. Jason, thank you. I'm Jason Miller, and you've been listening to the discussion Innovation in Government, sponsored by Kerasoft on Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Innovation.